Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was wandering in the Magadan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha. There he went to the potter, Bhagawa, and said to him, If it is not inconvenient for you, Bhagawa, I will stay one night in your workshop. It is not inconvenient for me, venerable sir, but there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, venerable sir. Now there was a clansman named Pukusati, who had gone forth from the home life into homelessness, out of faith in the Blessed One. And on that occasion, he was already staying in the potter's workshop. Then the Blessed One went to the Venerable Pukusati and said to him, If it is not inconvenient for you, Bhikkhu, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend. Let the venerable one stay as long as he likes. Then the blessed one entered the potter's workshop, prepared a spread of grass at one end and sat down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect and establishing mindfulness in front of him. Then the Blessed One spent most of the night seated in meditation, and the Venerable Pukusati also spent most of the night seated in meditation. Then the Blessed One thought, This clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose I were to question him. So he asked the Venerable Pukusati, Under whom have you gone forth, Bhikkhu? Who is your teacher? Whose Dharma do you profess? Friend, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from a Sakyan clan. Now a good report of that blessed Gotama has been spread to this effect. That Blessed One is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. I have gone forth under that Blessed One. That Blessed One is my teacher. I profess the Dharma of that Blessed One. But Bhikkhu, where is that Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, now living? There is, friend, a city in the northern country named Savati, the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, is now living there. But Bhikkhu, have you ever seen that Blessed One before? Would you recognize him if you saw him? No, friend, I have never seen that Blessed One before, nor would I recognize him if I saw him. Then the Blessed One thought, This clansman has gone forth from the home life into homelessness under me. Suppose I were to teach him the Dharma. So the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Pukusati thus, Bhikkhu, I will teach you the Dharma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Pukusati replied. The Blessed One said this. Bhikkhu, this person consists of six elements, six bases of contact, and eighteen kinds of mental exploration. 
and he has four foundations. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. This is a summary of the exposition of the six elements. Bhikkhu, this person consists of six elements. There are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. This person consists of six bases of contact. There are the base of eye contact, the base of ear contact, the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, the base of body contact, and the base of mind contact. Bhikkhu, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. On seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form productive of joy. One explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odour with the nose, on tasting a flavour with the tongue, on touching a tangible object with the body. One explores either a sound or an odour or a flavour or a tangible object, productive of grief, or explores one productive of joy, or explores one productive of equanimity. On cognizing a mind object with the mind, one explores a mind object productive of joy, one explores a mind object productive of grief, one explores a mind object productive of equanimity. Bhikkhu, this person has four foundations. There are the foundation of wisdom, the foundation of truth, the foundation of relinquishment, and the foundation of peace. One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. How, Bhikkhu, does one not neglect wisdom? There are these six elements, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. What, Bhikkhu, is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally, belonging to oneself, is solid, solidified, and clung to, that is, head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, contents of the stomach, feces, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now, both the internal earth element 
and the external earth element are simply earth element. And that should be seen as it actually is, with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. What bhikkhu is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, and clung to, that is, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, and clung to. This is called the internal water element. Now both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is, with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element. What bhikkhu is the fire element? The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, and clung to, that is, that by which one is warmed, ages, and is consumed, and that by which what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted, gets completely digested, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, and clung to. This is called the internal fire element. Now both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire element. And that should be seen as it actually is, with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the fire element. What bhikkhu is the air element? The air element may be either internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. That is, upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the belly, winds in the bowels. Winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. This is called the internal air element. 
Now both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is, with proper wisdom, thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the air element. What bhikkhu is the space element? The space element may be either internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial and clung to. That is, the holes of the ears, the nostrils, the door of the mouth, and that aperture whereby what is eaten, drunk, consumed and tasted gets swallowed, and where it collects and whereby it is excreted from below, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial and clung to. This is called the internal space element. Now both the internal space element and the external space element are simply space element. And that should be seen as it actually is, with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the space element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the space element. Then there remains only consciousness, purified and bright. What does one cognize with that consciousness? One cognizes, this is pleasant. One cognizes, this is painful. One cognizes, this is neither painful nor pleasant. Independence on a contact to be felt as pleasant, there arises a pleasant feeling. When one feels a pleasant feeling, one understands. I feel a pleasant feeling. One understands, with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as pleasant, its corresponding feeling, the pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as pleasant, ceases and subsides. In dependence on a contact to be felt as painful, there arises a painful feeling. When one feels a painful feeling, one understands. I feel a painful feeling. One understands. With the cessation of that same contact to be felt as painful, its corresponding feeling ceases and subsides. Independence on a contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, there arises a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When one feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, one understands. I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. One understands, with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, its corresponding feeling ceases and subsides. Bhikkhu 
just as from the contact and friction of two fire sticks. Heat is generated and fire is produced. And with the separation and disjunction of these two fire sticks, the corresponding heat ceases and subsides. So too, independence on a contact to be felt as pleasant, to be felt as painful, to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant. There arises a corresponding feeling. One understands, with the cessation of any of these contacts, its corresponding feeling ceases and subsides. Then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy and radiant. Suppose Bhikkhu, a skilled goldsmith or his apprentice, were to prepare a furnace, heat up the crucible, take some gold and tongs, and put it into the crucible. From time to time he would blow on it. From time to time he would sprinkle water over it. And from time to time he would just look on. That gold would become refined, well refined, completely refined, faultless, rid of dross, malleable, wieldy and radiant. Then whatever kind of ornament he wished to make from it, whether a golden chain or earrings or necklace or a golden garland, it would serve his purpose. So too, Bhikkhu, then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy and radiant. He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity, so purified and bright, to the base of infinite space, and to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mine, supported by that base, clinging to it, would remain for a very long time. If I were to direct this equanimity, so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness, to the base of nothingness, to the base of neither perception nor non-perception, and to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mine, supported by that base, clinging to it, would remain for a very long time. He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity, so purified and bright, to the base of infinite space, and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness, to the base of nothingness, to the base of neither perception nor non-perception, and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. He does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non-being. Since he does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non-being, he does not cling to anything in this world. When he does not cling, he is not agitated. When he is not agitated, he personally attains Nibbāna. He understands thus, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being.
If he feels a pleasant feeling, he understands. It is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. If he feels a painful feeling, he understands. It is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands. It is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a neither pleasant nor painful feeling, he feels it detached. When he feels a feeling terminating with the body, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with the body. When he feels a feeling terminating with life, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with life. He understands, on the dissolution of the body, with the ending of life, all that is felt, not being delighted in, will become cool right here. Bhikkhu, just as an oil lamp burns in dependence on oil and a wick, and when the oil and wick are used up, it does not get any more fuel. It is extinguished from lack of fuel. So too, when he feels a feeling terminating with the body, a feeling terminating with life, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with life. He understands, on the dissolution of the body, with the ending of life, all that is felt, not being delighted in, will become cool right here. Therefore, a bhikkhu possessing this wisdom possesses the supreme foundation of wisdom. For this bhikkhu is the supreme noble wisdom, namely, the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering. His deliverance being founded upon truth is unshakable. For that is false bhikkhu, which has a deceptive nature, and that is true, which has an undeceptive nature. Nibbana. Therefore a bhikkhu possessing this truth possesses the supreme foundation of truth. For this bhikkhu is the supreme noble truth, namely Nibbāna, which has an undeceptive nature. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he acquired and developed attachments. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a bhikkhu possessing this relinquishment possesses the supreme foundation of relinquishment. For this bhikkhu is the supreme noble relinquishment, namely, the relinquishing of all attachments. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire and lust. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. 
Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced anger, ill will, and hate. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced ignorance and illusion. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a bhikkhu possessing this peace possesses the supreme foundation of peace. For this bhikkhu is the supreme noble peace, namely, the pacification of lust, hate and delusion. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations, and when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. Bhikkhu, I am, is a conceiving. I am this, is a conceiving. I shall be, is a conceiving. I shall not be, is a conceiving. I shall be possessed of form, is a conceiving. I shall be formless, is a conceiving. I shall be percipient, is a conceiving. I shall be non-percipient, is a conceiving. I shall be neither percipient nor non-percipient, is a conceiving. Conceiving is a disease. Conceiving is a tumour. Conceiving is a dart. By overcoming all conceivings, Bhikkhu, one is called a sage at peace. And the sage at peace is not born, does not age, does not die. He is not shaken and is not agitated. For there is nothing present in him by which he might be born. Not being born, how could he age? Not aging, how could he die? Not dying, how could he be shaken? Not being shaken, why should he be agitated? Bhikkhu Bear in mind this brief exposition of the six elements. Thereupon the Venerable Pukusati thought, Indeed, the teacher has come to me. The sublime one has come to me. The fully enlightened one has come to me. Then he rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, and prostrating himself, with his head at the Blessed One's feet, he said, Venerable Sir, a transgression overcame me, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, I presumed to address the Blessed One as friend. Venerable Sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression seen as such. 
for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Bhikkhu, a transgression overcame you, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, you presumed to address me as friend. But since you see your transgression as such, and make amends in accordance with the Dharma, we forgive you. For it is growth in the Noble One's discipline, when one sees one's transgression as such, makes amends in accordance with the Dharma, and undertakes restraint in the future. Venerable Sir, I would receive the full admission under the Blessed One. But are your bowl and robes complete, Bhikkhu? Venerable Sir, my bowl and robes are not complete. Bhikkhu, Tathagatas do not give the full admission to anyone whose bowl and robes are not complete. Then the Venerable Pukusati, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, rose from his seat, and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he departed in order to search for a bowl and robes. Then, while the Venerable Pukusati was searching for a bowl and robes, a stray cow killed him. Then a number of bhikkhus went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Pukusati, who was given brief instruction by the Blessed One, has died. What is his destination? What is his future course? Bhikkhus, the clansman Pukusati was wise. He practiced in accordance with the Dharma, and he did not trouble me in the interpretation of the Dharma. With the destruction of the five lower fetters, the clansman Pukusati has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will attain final Nibbāna there without ever returning from that world. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Mm. 